Up now, our session on the algorithm for equality with Shelley Zalehis, founder and CEO of The Female Quotient, an advisory company that advances gender equality in the workplace. She's the first female CEO ranked in the research industry's top 25 and the co-founder of See Her, a movement to increase the accurate portrayal of women and girls in advertising and media. She's joined by moderator Katie Grass, Chief Customer Officer at Suzy. Well, gotta thank your, you. Gotta get your branding. Everybody for joining us. Um, I am on stage with the godmother of market research, a goddess, Shelley Zalis. So I am delighted to be here with you. We're going to talk um, kind of in two halves. A little bit about, um, of course, the female quotient and everything you're doing with gender equality. But I want to take us all back because you are the founder of online market research. You have managed, mentored so many of my former bosses, mm. and in fact, even our very own Natalie Roebuck um, had worked for you way back in the early 2000s. So I'd love to kind of hear from you. Tell a story about how you pioneered online market research in those early years. Oh, God. Well, first of all, there's a lot of people that have been in online. I mean, I, I have Shelly at AOL.com, so that might be saying something. So I'm probably older than all of you here. <laughs> so I've been around the block for quite some time. But, uh, you know, it was one of those moments where I think people always tell you that it's not the right time. I mean, when I migrated research from offline to online, people were on 14.4 modems. So it was really slow. And if you think about testing video, which now that's just like mainstream or watching video, it would stop and start. So imagine going on a freeway that's really crowded, which was the analogy that we used at the time. If there's traffic, you're not going to move. And if there's no traffic, you could go quickly. So if you are on a very slow modem, you're not going to be able to watch video. And everyone at the time had very different levels of modems. 288 and 144, and then those with T1 lines, if anyone even knows what I'm talking about, because at the time, only wealthy old men with broadband connections actually was enjoying internet. And we actually would go around teaching people what um, HTTP was. I mean, we did like internet 101 training. And actually, one CMO said to me, well, how do you get online? Is it in the yellow pages? I mean, that's how long ago this was. And so when I went to my bosses, I was at ASI at the time, and ASI was later acquired by Ipsos. I said, let's migrate research from offline, mall intercept and, and telephone research, which is really what, what we were doing at the time. And they said, well, it's not the right time because nobody's online. So how do you really have a representative population? And so I remember this must have been in about 1998, maybe-ish. And I was sitting on a panel with um, Larry Mock. Does anyone know that name? Larry Mock? Larry Mock was the chief research officer of Procter & Gamble. Does anyone know Procter & Gamble? <laughs> so my bosses, Bob, Jerry, Peter, Paul, Ringo, Starr, <laughs> all said to me, um, well, you're going to be on stage with Larry, our most important client, stick to the script. And anyone that knows me, at least today, knows I don't stick to any script. And so how do you miss this really important moment when I wanted to migrate research from offline to online, but my bosses all told me I have to wait for the right time? So here I am with Larry Mock, and I'm whispering to him, and I come off the stage, and my bosses are all very anxious. And they said to me, what did you say? What did you say to him? What did you whisper? I said, I just asked him, when is the right time for ASI to come to Procter & Gamble and talk about migrating research from offline to online? And they said, well, what did he say? And I said, he said, come next week, and let's talk about it. And I said, great. And my boss has said, great. Paul will go, Peter will go, Ringo will go, and Star will go. And I said, but what about Shelly? I'm the one that got the meeting. And they said, well, it's a boys club, and that's the right team to go. And I said, well, if I'm not going, I'm going to cancel the meeting, and you can all wait for the right time. 
And that was that. And Shelly left and started her own company. And it was called Online Testing Exchange. And there was no one online. Mm -hmm. And I had to build an ecosystem. And that was how it started. And they all told me it wasn't the right time, it was impossible, and I was gonna fail, and I wasn't the right person. And you know, it's how much risk are you willing to take? And I was willing to take it all, because I, I never wanted to look back and say shoulda, woulda, coulda. Because had I waited for that right moment, I wouldn't be where I am today, and I would not have been the mother of that invention. And we all would have had to wait for SurveyMonkey to create it. Yeah. That's okay. The godmother of market research. Like, oh. Online, not of, market of research. Online research. There was a lot of market researchers. <laughs> and there was a lot of, you know, things happening. There was Greenfield and there was, you know, there was DMS and there's, oh. but there was no blender at the time. And there was no sample system that was mixing it all up and amalgamating it. And I mean, there's a whole long story, but you know, when I was, I, I do a lot of guest lecturing at business schools because I, I love the curiosity of mindset. And I remember thinking about, if you think about random digit dialing, of how we did offline. I don't know if I'm speaking like a foreign language, <laughs> German, or, or actually Japanese or Chinese, because that's the hardest language ever to learn. But if you think about how we used to recruit, it's RDD, randomization. And I thought to myself, how are we gonna build an online, truly random sample? And random digit dialing was from the, 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 um, the, what's it called, uh, telephone books. That's how we used to do it in the olden days, from telephone books. And you would just pick random phone numbers and people would call. That was how we did telephone interviews and get random sample. That was called RDD. And so I thought, okay, I have to try to build an RDD sample. And I remember closing my eyes, I'll never forget this moment in time, and thinking, I have to replicate the same thing. How do you get this random sample like that from online? But there is no online. And Greenfield had a sample, but if I just pulled from them, that would be skewed. And DMS had a sample, but if I just pulled from them, that would be skewed. And if I just, and if one of those sample companies said, we're not gonna sell you sample anymore, I'm out of business. And that kind of pissed me off. So I said, I have to get sample from everybody. How am I going to do that? I need to build a blender and put everything in this blender. And I need, if I needed 18 to 24, I want one from this, one from this, one from this, one from this. And I'll build an RDD system. And I was speaking at Penn at Wharton, and I'm talking to this graduate course, and I said, oh my God, it's one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> we need to get fish from all, like sea and river and ocean and pop, 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 pop. And I said, get up. And the whole class got up. I bet you didn't want all this information, did you? I love this information. Do you want all this information? <laughs> I never actually told this whole story. You're the first to hear it. <laughs> and. The class gets up and I said, we're gonna go to the library. And we all walk and we went to the children's library and I read them the story, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Okay. And that is how you all have online sample today. And I built what became the router and it's how you all have online sample. And I started building the largest router in the world, including from mobile because I thought, oh, mobile, which was not even a thing then, let's get that. And I started pulling from hundreds of sample providers so that it would And that's how we built the model that you use today. And so for all your entrepreneurs out there, I just want you to know, it's why I come up with the concept that you need to be the first, which is the innovator. I had no clue what I was doing. And you're gonna make your mistakes. The second is the copycat, and there's plenty of them. They will copy everything you do, 
but no one will know what's under the hood. No one knows the stories I'm telling you today. The third is the sweeper. They will ride in on that white horse. The ecosystem was built and they will win the game. The money will be there. So you all have to be the first, then you gotta copy yourself, and then you gotta be the third. Beat your own, beat yourself, so that nobody will beat you at your own game. First, second, third, boom. That's how I started. I love that, and I love that you didn't let somebody else be the second and the third, but you kept reinventing yourself. Coming wasn't back to easy, that second act. but it was fun. I'm sure it was, absolutely. So you kind of pioneered in a, in a fairly traditional industry, market research, insights, has always been kind of fairly traditional. This is the way we've done it, this way we'll do it again. And of course now with the advent of AI and Gen AI, we're in that place again. So what advice do you have for us today on how we can be those pioneers and trailblazers in what is a fairly traditional industry? Hmm. Well, there's always a solution and you're always gonna get people telling you why not, what's wrong versus what's right. So don't listen to all the naysayers because there's gonna be plenty of them. And how do they know what's not gonna work? Because they never did it, by the way. So they're gonna be the first to tell you what you can't do, but they never did it. So, mm -hmm. and there's always a solution. You just gotta find it. So when I started online, I was doing CPG market research my whole career. I knew everything up from womb to tomb, package testing and, and cereals and, and drinks and you know all of that. But I was never in the entertainment business. And so I decided I was gonna start in the hardest thing ever in an industry I knew nothing about, which was entertainment, the movie business. There was only one research company called NRG, Joe Farrell, that dominated and owned Actually, it was a monopoly. Nobody was ever able to break into movie research because he was the godfather of movie research. And he did mall, intercept, mall testing. So I don't know if anyone knows that company, but he was God and actually genius. So I decided I was gonna go into movie research and break the monopoly. No idea how, because I knew nothing about movie testing. And so I went to Warner Brothers and knocked on the door of the chief research officer, Dan Rosen, and Richard DeBelso. And I said, I'm Shelly Zalis. I have this crazy idea to pioneer online research. I know nothing about movie research. I know everything about packaged goods, nothing about movie research, but I have a proposition for you. I said, are you perfectly satisfied with how you do movie research today? And he said, how is anyone perfectly satisfied? That was my opening. And I said, great. Here's my deal. I am gonna test every spot, every trailer, which was two and a half minutes long. Remember, doing online was really hard. 14-4 modems, remember that. And I needed a DRM solution, which I had to build to protect the property. I said, give me everything you've tested with NRG. I'm gonna parallel test it for free to calibrate your scores. And that's that, that's the deal. And he said, okay, deal. And he said, but we have one problem. I have a contract with NRG and it's an exclusive contract. And so, and he's the godfather. And if he finds out we're testing with you, he's gonna have a problem with us. I said, let me see the contract. And I see the contract and in the contract, it said exclusivity for mall testing. I said, I'm online. He said, you're right. And I said, I'll sign in as Jane Doe. And that's, that was that. And so there's always a yes. You just have to find it. But you gotta believe in yourself. You gotta be resilient. You gotta have thick skin. And you gotta love what you do. And so I would say when purpose meets passion, you're unstoppable. I was unstoppable. And there were a lot of kinks, I gotta tell ya. But it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was a wow, you know? We just excited and delighted people. And whenever I would deliver the results, what I said to the client was keep giving the Joe Farrell results of 
the top lines because I could not match that for two years. But what our online scores did that was wow factor was the verbatim testimony. So anyone that was in the early days of online, the wow was the open-ended responses. It was bold exclamations, Nicole, you know this so well. It, it was that. I said, just supplement those. And all of a sudden, the producers and the directors were saying, where did these verbatims come in? And then, Tom Hanks, oh my God, he was amazing. Wow, 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 exclamation, exclamation. And they loved that. And then the, the researchers would say, oh, that came from online. I want more online. I want more online. And I always delivered the results with homemade chocolate chip cookies. I, make, I don't know how to cook, <laughs> but I can bake great chocolate chip cookies and milk. And so they would read the results and love it. And that, I mean, then it da 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 da. And then one studio after the next started hearing about it. And then that was that. And then once I could calibrate the norms, we replaced offline. And then Joe Farrell was like, who is she? <laughs> who is she? And then if you work with her, then I became, she became her. If you work with her, and all of a sudden her became the thing. And that was that. And if we could do two and a half minute videos, we could do 30 second spots. And then I had 30 categories at Proctor. And I mean, doing CPG, which 30 days, you know, I had to deliver movie testing 30 spots in a weekend. If you could do the hardest thing, you could do the easiest thing. So I always did the hardest thing to do, to do the easiest thing. Yeah. So, you know, and we were doing, I mean, my son Jake is here. I used to do little um, talking heads in my surveys. You know, we were so ahead of itself. We were always 10 years ahead. Mm -hmm. So now when everyone is using all that and they're like, mm, I'm like, that was so long ago, but it was too ahead of itself. People didn't even get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, Shelley, thank you so much because my entire career has been in online market research and you really pioneered the way and is such a hero of mine. I'd love to hear a little bit more, which obviously brings us into the kind of second half of your career around kind of gender equality. How did that experience then shape what you went on to build um, with the female conscience? Mm. Well, I mean, I was the only female CEO of Top 25 in market research. And that, that was never an issue for me. I, you know, wasn't a big deal, even though I'm sure I'm paid a shitload of money. I'm sure I was always paid less than men, but I never really thought about that. So I should really go back and look at my pay stubs. <laughs> That'd be pretty interesting. Um, that was not... Although, you know, I always had food and flowers and things in my office and, you know, we had a, a life stage accommodation culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I created the uncorporate rules mm -hmm. in my company and I built the company around what I always wish I had in the corporate world. So if you build around the caregiver, it's going to work for everybody. So, I mean, that was always, you know, a given for me. Do you have examples around what you mean by kind of building around the caregiver? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, well, we could talk about a million examples, but I don't believe in titles. You know, I think titles are dumb, which is why I gave myself chief troublemaker, give myself permission to break every rule that makes no sense. And, you know, I, I would not invite people by hierarchical titles, VP and above or SVP. And above. Like, how many VPs are there? How many SVPs? Like, I don't think that defines anybody. I would invite people by name to meetings and then say, if you want to come to a meeting that you're not invited to, you're welcome to come. But if you come to too many meetings that you're not invited to, you don't have enough on your plate. Like, you know, like open culture and no offices and no, you know, sit where you want and listen to other people and shift accordingly. Because I think everyone should understand what everyone else is doing that makes you a better employee and a better coworker. Or if you're done with what you're doing, get out of the office. Like no one is tracking time. Yeah. But if you're leaving too early all the time, you don't have enough to do and cover each other's asses. Like, you know, and don't hide. Yeah. Like go pick up your kids. And we did have bring your pets to work, but then the dogs kept getting bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger and the bowls became beds and this and that. So that had to stop. But you know, when we had 250 employees, you know, and if you're having a bad day, go home or go in a little room that we had and or talk about it, you know, but don't hide things because it's going to, we're going to find it. So share it and find a solution, right? Like it was just an open, and we shared the good, bad, and the ugly. I shared results all the time. 
and we talked about them. If they were bad, they were bad. If they were good, they were good. And we, we were a big family. Yeah. You know, there was no secrets. We were fully transparent. We had basketball court, we played basketball, then we played volleyball, and, and you know, life stage accommodation. Take the time you need. You know, I don't, I'm not someone that believes in, and parental leave is not maternity or paternity. It was, because no. that's how my husband and I, we share responsibility. Mm -hmm. At home and at work, or I don't believe in a three month off. You're you're always on. So take the time you need when you need it. Like take three months or take every day for four hours a day. I mean it's one life with five dimensions. Yeah. Your career, your family, your community, your friends, and yourself. They're not even pods. So adjust. Yeah. It's life stage accommodation. And you know, I want everyone to stay forever. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I said, good to see you. I saw you back there. It's like, you know, take the time you need, when you need it, how you need it. Like yeah. for me, I love what I do. When you love what you do, it's called passion. When you don't, it's called stress. It shouldn't be stress. Yeah. What, like, enjoy it, because you have one life to live. Exactly. And you shouldn't look back and say, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yep. So own it. You were really inspiring. You created the algorithm of equality framework. So I'd love for you to explain to the audience a little bit about what that is and how companies should be adopting it. Yeah, so I sold my company three times. And so it was three different iterations. And then after I sold to Ipsos, um, you know, so OTX was um, 250 employees operating in six cities, two countries and generating probably 60 million in revenue when we sold, and this is a long time ago. Well, you know my, my dates better than I do these days, but <laughs> it was you know, a, a long, long time ago, and it was always, as I said, 10 years ahead of itself. So someone else sold it for, I sold it for 80 million, someone sold it for a billion, you know, <laughs> sold the router for a lot more money than I did. Good for him. You probably all know him, too. Trained and coached him. Yeah, yeah I'm so proud of him, too. Yeah. Like, I, I love that. And I um, stayed at Ipsos for five years, running global innovation in 83 countries. So I sold an $80 million co company to a company gen with 16,000 employees doing $2.6 billion in revenue. And uh, I knew once you sell a, a boutique -y wow company to a big giant steamship, I was like a little motorboat. It's not as exciting, um, but as a mother of the company, you want it to grow and blossom and, and scale, and it, it's where it needed to be. And um, while I was there, once again, I was one of two women on a board, a public board now, of 26 people. I remember sitting at the table, and they were moving my employees around like chess pieces. And tears came down my eyes. And I was pulled aside after the meeting, and I was told that there was no room for emotion in the boardroom. And I always talk about heartbeat moments. There's your head, which is cognitive, and then there's your heart, which is the emotion. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. You can't ignore your heart. It's going to go where it's going to go. And I remember thinking at that moment, I had a speech for thousands, and my speech was called, Bring Emotion to the Boardroom, exclamation point. And that was that. You know, I was a very well-known CEO, and it was going to go my way. And I started talking about empathy and compassion and human-centric leadership. And that the best CEOs that I knew, the most essential skills were compassion, empathy, passion, purpose-driven leadership, listening, and leading with your heart. And that's when I then created the Girls' Lounge. And I decided it was time to give back with generosity what I wish I had my entire career, which was girlfriends in business. I am 62 years old. I never had girlfriends in business. I had friends, but not at my level that actually supported one another as competitors and helped each other rise. There was such a scarcity of jobs at the top 
that you would dig your heels down, not intentionally, but that's just how we were set up. But why? That is dumb. And so I started the Girls' Lounge while I was at Ipsos. I was badass at Ipsos. I had permission without apology, without permission. I just took it. And I started the Girls' Lounge, these spaces at industry conferences for women to support other women. And then at the end of my five years, I decided that either Ipsos is going to fully support it, because I was having a side hustle job to pay the bills. I had my day job, which was global innovation, and then my side hustle job while I was at Ipsos doing all this big innovation that I was selling while I was at Ipsos for Ipsos, but to pay the bills for the girls' lounge, because it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And my five-year contract ended, and they wanted me to renew. And I said, I will renew with the condition that you put the girls' lounge in my contract, that you will support it. And they said, we'll support it, but we can't write it into the contract, which you know what that means. <laughs> and so I left. And I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not resigning, but I'm not renewing. I'm going to take the girls' lounge with me. And that was that. And that was my moment of truth. And that became the female quotient. And 10 years later, you know, we have a largest global community of women in business, over 5.5 million across 100 countries and 30 industries. And my mission is to change the equation and close the gender gap in the workplace. That's phenomenal. And it's so refreshing to kind of hear that you, you heard no so many times and you said, I'm going to do it anyway. And it's so great for us all to kind of hear that. Um, the kind of other key area, and I know that the World Economic Forum stated it's going to take us about 134 years to close the gender pay gap. And not on my watch, not on your watch. <laughs> what do you think we can do and what is the female quotient doing to really kind of drive that forward and get there much faster? Well, you know, so we now have probably over 50 to 60 lounges a year all over the world. And, um, and now we're entering into the media space as well, creating content and, you know, all of that with our audience. But I, I was invited to the World Economic Forum 10 years ago with the invitation, we want you to come, but you might not feel welcome. Head said, don't go. Heart said, you must. So, of course, we went. And, you know, now 10 years later, we are the number one destination at the World Economic Forum, trending probably top five, with a two-story glass house, which is pretty remarkable. And it's 100... And 34 years to close the gender gap, mm -hmm. 237 years to close the pay gap, which is probably the most ridiculous thing you can ever possibly imagine. And no one even questions it. So you have a, the World Economic Forum with world leaders sitting at the table, and they have 17 sustainable goals. Gender equality is global goal five. So two years ago, I was just at the ESPYs, the Sports Awards, and they just celebrated Title IX, which is 50-year anniversary of Title IX. And I'm at the ESPY, sitting with legends surrounding me. And I come home that night, and I get this report. It was 131 years, two years ago. Now it's 134 years. And mm -hmm. tears came down my eyes, and I started to cry. And I was so angry about it. But more importantly, I was disappointed in myself that here I have walked away from a huge career to leave a legacy of change in the lifetime of my leadership to close the gender gap. And I see this report that says it's going to take 131 years. Shame on me. Shame on me. And all these world leaders sitting around a table, and nobody gives a shit about the fact that it's going to take 131 years. Where will you be? Where will your children be? Where will your grandchildren be in 131 years? That means nothing will change. So I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. And I said, why should it take 131 years to close the gender gap when we sent men to the moon in 10, we created the internet in 25, chat GPT now in two weeks, and a vaccine for a deadly disease in one year? Shame on us, not on my watch. And then I said, we will flip it in five. All I'm looking for is 10 Fortune 500 CEOs, one in every category, that is bold, brave, conscious leader, 
with intentional action for change that wants to leave a legacy of changing the lifetime of their leadership, step up to the plate. Because the only global goal out of 17 that a CEO can actually activate and close in the lifetime of their leadership is Global Goal 5. It is actually a man-made problem. Pay gap, we have the data sitting in front of our face. Why should Sally get paid less than Peter for the same goddamn job? Why? Procurement is supply chain. Less than 1% of supply chain goes to women-owned businesses. Why? 99, one. Uh, I don't think so. I don't get it. Workforce, I don't get it. Care, fixable. All these things are fixable problems. But a CEO cannot fix climate by themselves. They cannot fix education by themselves. They cannot fix hunger by themselves. But the only one they can fix is Global Goal 5. Choose it if you want to leave a legacy. And all of a sudden, they said, you're right. Huh. And that was that. So we have 7 out of 10, and we only launched it like a month ago. Phenomenal. Shelley, thank you so much for everything you've done um, for women, for market research. I know we're on... And for men. And for men. Men are so important in this conversation, which is why I don't say male allies. Conscious leaders, you know, we're all in this together. This is not a women's issue. This is all of our, you know, opportunities, I just want to say. So we need all of us in this. Yeah. One last question for you before we wrap up. What can we look forward to seeing from you next? Uh, well, F1, look at our car. We got a great car that is a rose gold car. It, 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 it like shines bright, glitters in the sunshine. Love so that. watch our little car going awesome. all over the place. So exciting. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Shelley. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>